Welcome to Exploring a Course in Miracles. I'm Emily Bennington Perry with the Circle of Atonement, and I'm here with Circle founder Robert Perry. And today we are talking about the formula for physical health according to A Course in Miracles. This podcast is a precursor to a new six week course that we're offering here at the Circle called Becoming a Course Based Healer, which you can learn more about at circleofa.org forward slash events. We're going to be talking a lot about healing and health over the next couple of months here. And so in our episode today, we thought we'd kick things off by covering what the course says about physical health. We have a two-point formula for gaining health from a course perspective that we're going to talk about today. We are also going to discuss the course's reframe for how we can use the body and a lot more. So Robert, today we are obviously talking about physical health and how to achieve it according to the course, but before we get into what the course has to say about physical health, it would be easy, I think, for students to assume that the course doesn't care about physical health because as we know, the course teaches the body is illusory, so why should we care about what happens to an illusory body? But the course is concerned about our physical health as it demonstrates in the teachings throughout. So let's start there. What does the course say about the physical health of our body? Well, I think that, you know, we'll be exploring that throughout. But just to start off with, we should acknowledge that the course does display concern about this topic of health. And I think it's understandable because whether the body's an illusion or not, when your health suffers, it consumes you. And I think we all know what that's like. If you don't know what that's like, you're very lucky. Uh, When your body is functioning well, you can forget about the issue of health. And we often do. But when it's got problems, when it has an illness, when it has some other kind of malady or injury, that health takes center stage and all you want is to get back to where everything's working well again. So I think we all know that health can completely consume us when it's not good. You know, when you're sick or when you're facing some disease or something chronic, your whole field of view narrows to what's going on in the body, particularly if you're in physical pain. It's hard to see outside of that. So yeah, we get it. Yeah. So our normal approach to physical health is that we think that health is um, a matter of what we do to and for our body. That's how we think of health conventionally. Do we have the right workouts? Do we have the right medicine? Do we have the right food, the right supplements and so on? And so our conventional view of health is that we attain physical health through physical means, right? Totally. Yeah. Basically, it's physical measures we apply to the body, whether that's medicine, like you said, supplements, diet, exercise. It's physical things that we apply to the body. So the body is kind of like a houseplant. Right. If you give it water and sunlight and good soil, the plant will be healthy. And before we start talking about the course's perspective, I think it's important to acknowledge that there's no getting around the differences those things make. One of the things I think of is just look at what the gains in longevity have been made because of modern medicine and healthcare. U.S. life expectancy in 1900 was 47 years. That was life expectancy 123 years ago. So it's not that these things don't make a difference. We know they make a huge difference. But that being said, the course's approach is that health comes from the mind. Health is a matter of the mind. And For that purpose, I want to read a really important statement that is only said once in the course, but it's said very clearly this one time. This is from chapter eight in the text. It says, when the ego tempts you to sickness, 
do not ask the Holy Spirit to heal the body, for this would merely be to accept the ego's belief that the body is the proper aim for healing. Ask rather that the Holy Spirit teach you the right perception of the body, for perception alone can be distorted. So don't ask the Holy Spirit to heal your body. Ask him to teach you the right perception of the body, because the Course says that's the source of sickness and health. That being said, go, go ahead. Well, I just, I, I feel like you might be just about to get into this, but I, I want to be very clear here at the beginning that we are saying that two things are true at once, as I love to say so often. Sickness originates in the mind from a course perspective. And while we're in these bodies and we experience ourselves in these bodies, medicine does seem to work. And so we're not asking anyone to throw out their pills. We're not asking anyone to discard conventional views about health keep working out, keep taking care of yourself, keep doing those things, but just understand that from a course perspective, sickness is a mental issue. So I just want to be really, really clear about that. Yeah. And, and there is, I mean, Helen was exercising all the time and Jesus never said, stop doing that. But from the course's perspective, there is an approach to health that is more profound and ultimately more effective. So when the Course says that it's all about right perception of the body, I think it's easy to get the wrong idea from that, because when we hear that, we think, oh, okay, well, how I see my body, do I see it in my mind as healthy? Do I visualize it as healthy? That's the big issue. And the Course doesn't talk like that. Its whole approach is not what we do to the body but what we do with the body. And that is something I don't hear anywhere. So the focus in the course is what we use it for, the purposes we serve with it. And that is the larger context for the passage I just read, because just, just two paragraphs before, we find this really great line, which is, health is the result of relinquishing all attempts to use the body lovelessly. So when we hear it's all about right perception of the body, we have to then switch that to it's about right use of the body, what we do with the body, which is obviously about behavior. And we'll, we'll get into that. Right. I love that encapsulation of the course's approach to physical health. So physical health does not come from the things we do to the body. I would even add the things we do for the body. Physical health comes from things we do with the body, the purpose that we assign to the body. And that brings us to our two-step formula that gives this podcast its name. And the course doesn't call this the two-step formula to physical health, but it is a two-step formula nonetheless. I know we normally are teasing the, the punchline of our podcast, and we don't normally give it away this early, but we're doing something different today. We're going to give you the whole punchline right here at the beginning. Which and, they probably appreciate. Yeah. <laughs> And it's actually, it's a pretty simple formula. So let's get into what is this two-part formula for the course's view of physical health. Yeah, and, and what's great is that this is found in different forms all over the course, both steps, often together, okay? And the formula is that health comes from, number one, lifting the conventional purposes we use the body for, and number two, using it only for purposes of communicating love to others. So let me just say that again. Step one is lifting the conventional purposes we use the body for. And step two is using it only for purposes of communicating love to others. And I want to just read one of the places, one of the many places where the course says some version of this formula. This is from the Manual for Teachers, section 12. It says, 
The central lesson is always this, that what you use the body for, it will become to you. Use it for sin or for attack, which is the same as sin, and you will see it as sinful. Because it is sinful, it is weak, and being weak, it suffers and it dies. So there's the health issue. Use it for purposes of bringing the word of God to those who have it not, and the body becomes holy. Because it is holy, it cannot be sick, nor can it die. And then to clarify that last comment about nor can it die, it says, when its usefulness is done, it is laid by, consciously laid aside, and that is all. That's incredible. It is. It's a revolutionary, different view of health. Yeah. So let's get into it. Let's pick apart these this, these two parts of this formula. So part one is lifting the conventional purposes that we have you used the body for. And there's a, a little trio of egoic purposes that we use the body for that's highlighted in the course. And so let's talk about those because the the conventional ways that we use the body from an egoic perspective in the course is that we use the body for attack, for pleasure, and for pride. So let's go through each one of those one by one. Let's start with yeah. attack. So well, actually, let me just, I, well, I want to read the quote first. That's okay. Let me, let me read the quote. You read the quote. I read the quote. So, <laughs> so in chapter six, there's a quote that, that, talks about this trio and it actually says the ego uses the body for attack for pleasure and for pride the insanity of this perception makes it a fearful one the holy spirit sees the body only as a means of communication so let's get into parsing out attack pleasure and pride yeah so starting with attack i think we think of attack as being a lot more kind of narrow and and focus than it is i mean of course there's attack where we directly attack someone you know maybe verbally attack someone there's also much more subtle attack which goes on all the time and there's also just different forms of mistreating people by running over them you know so to speak ignoring them neglecting them using them exploiting them basically controlling them there's all kinds of ways in which we use the body to get what we want. And what we want is so often, maybe even subtly, at the expense of others. And all of that falls under the heading of attack. All of that, I'm moving you around like a chess piece so I can get my way, is attack. And then the course draws a line directly from our attacks to disease of the body. So let's talk about that. Yeah, and this is something that can be found all throughout the course. The idea is that once we attack, even if we don't consciously realize we have attacked, something in our mind registers that as guilt. And then guilt in the course is the source of sickness. And my favorite, this is stated so many times, but my favorite statement of that is in the psychotherapy supplement where it says, illness can be but guilt's shadow. Grotesque and ugly, since it mimics deformity. If a deformity is seen as real, what could its shadow be except deformed? So I know that all sounds like a bit of a jumble, but the idea is guilt is like a deformed emotion inside of us, okay? And then it casts a shadow onto the body, and the shadow it casts is the deformity that we call illness. So all illness is a shadow cast by our guilt. And that's so, why we're all carrying different forms of illness because we stack up guilt from all the attacking that we do. That's, I mean, that's mind blowing. Like who thinks of illness in that way? We always think that when we get sick, it's just a matter of bad luck, bad genetics, a host of different reasons. We never 
trace it to guilt. And in fact, he says something like that in the course, doesn't he? It's like of all the reasons I'm so paraphrasing here, but he says something like of all the reasons that you think you get sick, your guilt is, is not on that list. Right. More or less, more or less. Yeah. It's That's all a, the things that, that cause you suffering. Okay. So of all the things that cause us suffering, guilt is not on that list. And yet what the course is essentially saying is that when you attack you can't help but store up some kind of unconscious guilt for the ways in which you're being unloving. And that is the root of your sickness. Yeah. It's not your bad genetics. It's your unconscious guilt over your, your lovelessness. Right. Those things are middlemen for a deeper process. Have you ever heard anything like that anywhere else than the course? I think there are things that are kind of similar. I think in the ancient world, we we tended to think, I mean, way back when, they tended to think of guilt, sorry, of, of disease as being a manifestation of your sins. So there is a commonality there, even though the Course would say there's no real sin. Um, you, you feel sinful, but you're not actually sinful. I but still there's a commonality. I do think that modern medicine and modern sentiments are are catching up to the idea that what happens to us emotionally like mentally has an effect on the body so we're understanding stress as a conventional medicine says that stress is the root cause of, of disease or can be a root cause of disease so i can think that, cause, that yeah. kind of connection is starting to happen it's just that as usual the course takes it way further another of our egoic ways in which we use the body is pleasure. I know we recognize seeking pleasure as something that can be egoic, and yet it feels like something necessary here in these bodies as well. So let's get into that idea as well. Yeah, well, the Course really has this trio that it repeats two different times, which is comfort, pleasure, and safety. And I think it's helpful to think of them as separate categories, even though they kind of, you know, all overlap with each other. And when you think about our desire for physical comfort, pleasure, and safety, that's a huge amount of life. It's gigantic. Um, and it's not that those things are sinful, it's that they're separating. Because who feels your pleasure except you? It is a private experience that others are not feeling. And the way the Course talks about this is that through our search for comfort, pleasure, and safety, the body becomes an end in itself, okay? And if the body is what separates us from others, if it's like the wall around our mind that makes our mind private and inaccessible to others, it separates us. It's like, for instance, let's say you are, you have this wonderful property, okay, beautiful mansion, and you build a really high wall around it to keep everybody out. The more attention you lavish on that wall, the more you decorate the wall and glorify the wall and reinforce the wall, that's all a statement of separation. Now, our body is that wall. So the more we make it an end in itself, the more we're stroking the thing that keeps us separate from others, the more it's a statement of separation. Right. And I think we know this when we're with, if we're with somebody that is really into their body, it's comfort and pleasure and safety. We know that it can, that can make us feel alone. And so what the course says is that by making the body an end in itself, we are expressing the purpose of separation. Separation is a mental illness. And that mental illness will get projected onto the body as physical illness. I think that is a really good way to think about this idea of pleasure, because if you say, okay, pleasure is a negative, I think it kind of stiffens our spine a bit or like, well, sure. hey, hold on, it's taking all the fun out of, out of life. But I think the, the key factor here is 
when you are making the body as the end in and of itself, that's where it takes a detour into a direction that's going to get us in trouble. So it's okay to want to have pleasurable experiences in your body, but we don't realize how isolating that is. And so if that's all we're trying to do is seek after ways in which the body can have pleasure, then it is a very isolating experience. And so, okay, so where do we find, like, where does, where's the zone where pleasure is okay? Well, I think as long as we have egos, we're going to need pleasure and seek pleasure. The course, though, wants us to see through the illusion of pleasure, because what it says is that when the pleasure is over, the the end result it is it has reinforced your view that you're a body, that the body is real. And the course says that pain does the exact same thing. It reinforces your view that you're a body, that your body is real. And so in the end, it says that pleasure and pain are not ultimately different because they both have the same purpose, which is to reinforce the reality of the body. And the idea that we are this body, that we're cooped up inside of it, we're imprisoned in it, we're at its mercy, that's a painful thing. So from the course's standpoint, even though, yeah, we are going to seek it now, we shouldn't feel guilty about it, we need to ultimately see through the illusion of it. Mm. And the third in the ways in which the ego wants us to use the body is pride. And so- We all, I think, know what it means to use our body as a source of pride. It reminds me of what you were saying just a minute ago about building the wall and making sure that the wall is is beautiful, but it's still the walls meant to separate you from everyone else. And I think we do that with pride as well. The more we pour into our appearance, the more separating that experience is as well. Well, pride is a separating thing. I mean, pride is about oneself. Right. And there's a great, I mean, I can't resist. There's a great passage about, about pride in relation to the body that I just have to read. This is from chapter 24 and it's about preserving the body. It's like, you know, keeping it from aging quickly. It says, what would you save it for? And here's the issue of what is it for again? For in that choice lie both its health and harm. Save it for show as bait to catch another fish, to house your specialness in better style or weave a frame of loveliness around your hate and you condemn it to decay and pain. And that whole, most of that list there, I think is about pride. Mm -hmm. Save it for show, of, bait to I catch know. another fish. This is one of those incredible course quotes that you wonder why it isn't, like, why don't more students know about this idea in the course? I mean, that's just really, really good language. Are we using our bodies to as bait to catch another fish to house our specialness in better style or to weave a frame of loveliness around our hate? That's really, really powerful language. And it kind of hits home for for us because that is how we use the body. And the problem, though, is that the reason why we use the body in this way is because it works. So in right. in the in the world, when you take pride in your appearance, you tend to look better, you're treated better as a result, and that only encourages you to take more pride in your appearance. And I would argue that the same thing is true for attacking. We have learned in this world that you can actually attack your way to the top, as we have seen in our politics, for example. But with attacking, it does tend to catch up with you at some point. Like you can get away with it for so long and then all of a sudden people are like, wait a minute, you're being a jerk and and you tend to get knocked down a bit. But with pride, it's different. Pride's just a totally different story. Pride is so rewarded in this world that 
if you take care of your appearance, if you showcase your appearance, you can be applauded for that until the day you die. And so what happens is, is, is we're living in this culture that's telling us, use your body, use your body to get away with these things. And, and here we've got the course saying that's just completely the wrong approach. Yeah. No surprise that the course would say that's the wrong approach, but here we are again, faced with, okay, what works in the world and what the course is saying, and they do bump up against each other. It's true. I mean, that passage is very uncomfortable. He's lampooning things we all take for granted as positives, right? Save it for show. You can totally use your body to bait another fish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How's your specialness and better style? I mean, this is what the fashion industry is made up of. Right. And that last one, weave a frame of loveliness around your hate. I think what that's saying is even though you have the ugliness of hate inside, you can use your body to present a lovely picture that basically masks all the ugliness inside because the picture says, I'm lovely, I'm beautiful. And beautiful sounds sounds loving, sounds good. So anyway, I just think that he is lampooning things we absolutely take as positives in the use of the body. And what he's saying is ultimately all that makes the body sick. The attack, the pleasure, the pride, it ultimately makes it sick, which is the last thing we want to hear. Isn't that amazing? God, yeah. I, I just, I think, again, we, we have some understanding that you can only go so far with the tack. You can, you can get somewhere with it, but it, it, it will make you sick. I do feel like we're starting culturally to have some understanding of that. But pleasure and pride making us sick, I just don't think we've put that together at all. I don't think we put the attack one together really, because the people who we think of as having achieved greatness have largely achieved it, not through just being good. They've achieved it through effectively controlling the humans in their environment, which is attack. So, you know, the people that we have the statues of, I remember, you know, I've told you this story about, about this guy who had an NDE And his father has a federal court building named after him in Washington, D.C. So he was a a highly, you know, remembered, honored person. And and this guy, the son, had a near-death experience, went to the other side, and his father was like this sniveling creature on the ground on the other side. Because while we lauded him on this side and built a courthouse building named after him, the goodness wasn't there. Yeah. Well, as we say, there's no measure of mental health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So if the first point is lifting the conventional purposes that we have assigned to the body, the second point is using the body only for the purposes of communicating love to others. So this is really the heart of what this whole episode is about. And there's a quote in chapter eight that I want to read. It says, he will teach you to use your body only to reach your brothers so he can teach you his message through you. This will heal them and therefore heal you. Everything used in accordance with its function as he sees it cannot be sick. What an incredible idea that everything used in accordance with the Holy Spirit's function to communicate love, as he sees it, cannot be sick. So let's talk about this idea because it's a biggie. So yeah, this is, this is massive. To, to use your body only to reach your brothers so he can teach his message through you It sounds poetic and pretty, but when you think about it, it's revolutionary. And I think to appreciate how revolutionary it is, we have to understand that what the Course is talking about here is the question of what is our behavioral mode all day long. When you think that health is about what you do to and for your body, there's certain special things you do for part of the day. 
right? You exercise, you take supplements, you eat the right foods, you take your medication. He's talking about what behavioral mode are we in all day long? Now, I think our normal behavioral mode is how can my body get me what I want, right? That's that list of attack, pleasure, and pride. It's how can my body get me what I want? That's what I'm going through my day thinking. He's talking about a complete shift over to a new behavioral mode, which is how can I help? How can I use my body to let the Holy Spirit reach through me and communicate love? And that's a completely different behavioral mode to be in all day long. I know. It, if we think about what comes to mind from the moment we open our eyes in the morning to the moment we close them at night and assign a percentage of our day to how much of it is in concern of the body or trying to make the body more comfortable, more pleasurable, that kind of thing, attacking, controlling to get what we want. That's the span of our day, typically. And here he's saying, you can have a totally different day. You can assign your body a totally different purpose. And as a result of that, you will not only have a totally different life, but in its most extreme form, you won't get sick. Your body won't get sick. That's incredible. Yeah, that is incredible. So yeah. let's talk about like, what does that look like? What, what does a day spent in service to reach our brothers so that the Holy Spirit can teach his message through us? What does that look like? I assume it looks like being a loving and healing presence in the world, but let's get into the specifics. Yeah, well, in the Course's language, one way to express it is it's it's about being a miracle worker. And, you know, we've we've at the circle been looking at what that means for your day. So in the morning, he wants you to say, help me to perform whatever miracles you want of me today. Then to devote your day to giving miracles in this sense as expressions of love to others. He wants you to ask, who needs a miracle from me today? Or where can I go and what can I do to give miracles today? He wants you to be on, on the lookout all day long for the opportunities to give miracles because he says he sends them your way and it's up to you to notice them. He wants you to keep your mind in a state of miracle readiness where you are perceiving people as, as holy, as lovable, as innocent so that you're ready to respond to when they have a need. I mean, basically, he's talking about a mode of going through your day where all day long you are ready to give miracles. And this isn't something that we do in addition to everything else that we're doing over the course of our day. I mean, it can mean that, mean that because we'll have situations where someone presents themselves. We know they need help. We didn't expect it. And so we offer our help to them. But this is something that can be infused into every part of our day. So what I mean by that is you don't have to be going off looking for all of these opportunities to help other people. They will present themselves to you over the course of what you normally do in your every day. So whatever your job is, you can find a way to do that job with love, with more love. It doesn't have to be something separate. In other words, you can infuse this idea of helping other people and being a presence of love and forgiveness and healing in the world into your everyday as it is right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a both and sort of thing because he does talk about in chapter one of the text and in one of our cameos, cameo six, as you well know, he talks about letting inner guidance speed you through the trivial stuff like your shopping, like Helen was looking for a winter coat, so you have more time to devote to giving miracles. And he does talk about how, and later in the workbook, how giving miracles to others 
will return to you in the form of helping you with the problems you perceive. So that means you can afford to give less time to your problems, your own personal problems, because as you give miracles to others, those miracles will come back and miraculously solve your problems. So there is, there is a bit of a dance where we have to take care of survival. We have to take care. We have to shop for clothing. We have to solve our problems. And yet, from his standpoint, this act of giving miracles, of being, a, a as you put it, a, a, a healing influence, a healing presence, that should take center stage. And that's something that we can do no matter what else we're doing in our day. So for example, in that cameo that talks about Helen shopping for the winter coat, he also mentions that she was able to be helpful to the person who was helping her, the person, the the shop person who was sold her the coat. His child was mentally disabled and that was Helen's specialty. So in the process of buying the coat, she was able to be helpful. She was able to be a miracle worker to him. And I think that part of where we go wrong is we just don't think about our day that way. Uh, I imagine that most of us who are shopping for a coat are just thinking, I just want to get this coat. We're not thinking about how we can be helpful to everyone that we're interacting with along the way. And from a course perspective, that's what we're supposed to be thinking. And that's how we're supposed to be using our body. So yes, we need a coat to keep our body warm, but in the process of buying that coat, we can be thinking, I'm only here to be truly helpful. How can I be helpful to everyone that I'm interacting with? And in that sense, the body itself becomes this wholly neutral thing. So lesson 294 says my body is a wholly neutral thing. And so the perspective the course is trying to push us towards is the body isn't the end in itself. The body is just the the means for the expression of love to other people. And if we can think of it that way, if we can assign that purpose to our body, then physical health is the natural result. So it's a whole different orientation to life. One of the things that happens with the conventional mode is the body's like the master is ordering us around all day long. It's telling us what to feel. It's telling us to do all these things, to take care of it, to protect it, and so on. It becomes the boss. And what happens in this other mode is that it's just this neutral instrument. Um, It becomes the servant, and it just does what we tell it to do. I want to read this quote from Lesson 135 in the workbook because it really captures this whole idea. It says, the body, valueless, and hardly worth the least defense, need merely be perceived as quite apart from you. And it becomes a healthy, serviceable instrument through which the mind can operate until its usefulness is over. So it just becomes this neutral, healthy, serviceable instrument, quite apart from us, that we use for our purposes, for holy purposes, rather than that bosses us around and makes us serve its needs. That is such an important point because I think on some level, we're all afraid of getting sick. We're afraid of, if we are sick, we're afraid of what that's doing inside our body. It even goes down to just the emotions that we feel we are very, very bossed around by these bodies. And it, the body does feel like the master in many ways because our whole life becomes about just serving this body and making sure that it has what it needs to be comfortable, safe, pleasured, etc. And it reminds me, what you're saying reminds me of what we talk about here about the physical versus the spiritual journey. We think that our life is about going through and achieving what the body needs, acquisition of things for the purpose of making the body more comfortable. And that if we can do that, the spiritual journey, the journey of love, forgiveness, peace, and healing, and truth will just take care of itself. But it's actually the other way around. 
So we go through our life assigning our day the purpose of expressing love, being forgiving, being that presence of healing, seeking peace, seeking truth, and the physical aspects of you know, what we need in this world tend to take care of themselves if we put our focus on the spiritual, but it doesn't quite work the other way around. Like we can't mm -hmm. put our focus on the physical and expect the spiritual to take care of itself, but we can put our focus on the spiritual and the course is, is saying outright, when we do that, the physical will take care of itself. So that's that's an amazing reframe for us that I don't think we carry currently. And it really applies here to this topic. You know, yeah. if we take if we put our focus on the spiritual journey, he says physical health will follow. In some like incredibly superhuman ways, because the course says that when you have the kind of, of health that it's talking about, the body doesn't need care. So your body's not limited by time, meaning your body doesn't age, that you don't need protection from the weather, that you don't need food or drink, you don't get tired. And when you're done with the body, you just, as you mentioned in the quote before, you just lay it down. Now, no one is there yet. So I'm not kind of holding this up as, as, <laughs> as the, where, where we are, but it's an intriguing idea nonetheless of what the course says about the neutrality of the body. Like you don't even need to take care of it when you have this kind of mental health. It's a really intriguing set of claims. And, and you know, you've just gone through and summarized that briefly that everything you said is drawn from specific places in the course. He does make all those promises. And what I think helps me is to realize that there are examples of, to some degree, all of those things. There are examples of people who remain, because of their spiritual dedication, incredibly vigorous into their older years. There are people who don't need protection from the weather. Uh, there are people, apparently, um, there are stories of people who don't need food or drink, and there are some very famous stories of that. Uh, there are people who don't need to sleep. And my favorite example, as you know, is Peace Pilgrim. She, I think we all know. She, she's a great example of this because she completely gave herself to her mission, which was to bring peace. And she said that when she reached that complete devotion, she never had another ache or pain. So she's wandering out on roads, often totally by herself. Um, and her health was apparently perfect. She did age, but she was, you know, she's in her 70s, um, you know, walking all day. And she said that she could just tell her body to lay down on a concrete floor for the night and go to sleep, and it would do it. So the body became just a servant and wasn't troubling her with its own needs. She would only, um, she said one of her mottos was she would fast until given food. And she said she wouldn't even think about food until someone offered it to her. So she had achieved this state where the body was just this instrument for her mission. And it didn't come back at her with its own set of demands. And so that is a very, I think, impressive measure of achieving what the course is talking about here. There's so much to say about all of that. There's a couple of things. One is for anyone who's looking for the place in the course where it talks about how the body's health is fully guaranteed and you can be unaffected by weather or fatigue or age, et cetera, look in workbook lesson 136. Second, I know I always tease you about Peace Pilgrim and your love of, of her. And the, and I get in trouble for that, by the way. There are listeners who are you like, leave, leave Robert alone about Peace Pilgrim. Uh, <laughs> but I do have a, I, I share your admiration of her because if I could live that way, I would love to. You know, I, I, I feel like I'm not alone in focusing too much on the body worrying about whether the body is going to get sick. And, and I think that is, 
it creates its own sickness. The course even says that like one of the causes of sickness is when you feel like your body's not a good enough home for you. And so you make it sick as a result. And if we could all adopt more of Peace Pilgrim's attitude of I'm just here to be truly helpful and I'm not going to worry about this body. I know that as long as I have the purpose of expressing love and being a medium of love in this world, then I don't have to worry about the body. Then I, I, I think that that's a really healthy attitude to have. What I want to caution against and what I see in the course community that worries me to some degree is this idea of, okay, I'm, I'm a good course student. I read every day and yet I still have this disease or this chronic ache or pain, et cetera. And I just really want to caution against that approach because it's not helpful. You know, we, we are not at this level where we are so spiritually advanced that the body doesn't age. Peace Pilgrim wasn't even at that level, as you just pointed out. So what do you want to say, Robert, to anyone who is in that mode where they're thinking, well, wait a second, I feel like a really good devoted student and my body is still sick. So what's going on there? What would you say to that student? Well, I think that there's a temptation, especially among certain course students and certain spiritual seekers, to try to claim the accoutrements of, of advancement. And here in this topic, they are, you know, I'm not going to take medicine. I'll forego the need for good nutrition and exercise. I won't protect myself from the weather, you know, and those will be the signs of how advanced I am. I think what we need to do is that hard work of making what really is a global transition uh, in our behavioral mode, right? Like is our behavioral mode, let's be honest with ourselves, is our behavioral mode to go through our day asking ourselves, how can my body get me what I want? Or is our behavioral mode, how can I help? I am here only to be truly helpful. That the shift from one to the other is a massive shift. And you would, people around you would know if you had made that shift. Everyone around you would feel so differently if they could tell that your attention was on them and what they needed and what they were feeling, listening to them, caring about. Everyone would know if you'd made that shift. So what I would say is that the fruit of that shift is this amazing superhuman health the Course is talking about, a kind of a health that no one's even conceiving as possible. That's the fruit of it. You don't get fruit by just creating fruit. You plant the tree, you know, you water it, you, you tend to it, and then the fruit appears of itself. And here, the planting and watering and, and tending to the tree is making that shift from how can my body get me what I want to how can I help? And then the fruit appears of itself. You don't need to care for the body. It's impervious to all the things that other bodies are so vulnerable to. So don't worry about just manufacturing that fruit. Make that huge behavioral shift. And it's also not just isolated to what happens in this life, what you do in this life. The course is clear throughout that there's so much going on in our subconscious that we are just absolutely not in touch with. And so we're not coming into these bodies from the standpoint of just what's happening in this body. We're coming into, we're very, very ancient coming into these bodies with a lot of ancient stuff. And so you know, even though Helen, for example, was working out in her body as Helen, there's stories where she had previous lives where she was like hating and hurting people. And so we can't just say, well, I'm a good course student. I'm reading the course every day. Why am I still sick? We have to have 
a more sophisticated view of all that's going on here. Um, it's not just about this body. It's about like, there's a lot of, of stuff underneath this body as well. And so yeah. I think that that I, I mean, we're getting into the territory of um, like snake handling, really, you know, the, the Bible says that you can, if you're righteous enough, you can handle a snake or you can drink poison. And a lot of people have died doing that. And so I just want to be super clear that we're not at this level yet. And so we should just know that, own that, and not quit our day jobs around all of this. Yeah, I agree completely. But I think we don't really have to invoke the all the past life stuff and the unconscious things that we're bringing with us from eons ago. I think the fact is, is that we've all known very devoted spiritual seekers who think that they are flying high and everyone around them can feel their egocentricity, right? Every, we all can feel that their circle of concern is largely themselves, their own mind, their own bodies. This is not that subtle, right? Spiritual seekers, <laughs> dedicated spiritual seekers, Ordinary people, all of us are going through the day saying, how can my body get me what I want? It's basically about me. So to really move into that place where the, the real mode is, how can I help? I'm here only to be truly helpful. That's huge. We all have so much room. There's no mystery here. We're not there. We have a lot of room for growth in that area. So I think let's not kid ourselves as well. I know what you're doing. And I dig it. I appreciate it. You're not letting us hide in the metaphysics. You're not letting you're not letting me and everyone get away with just saying, well, we come in with a lot of ancient hate. So what are we supposed to do? It's like that quote that you read earlier about are we weaving, are we using the body to weave a frame of loveliness around our hate? That is something that we can address right now. You know regardless of what's going on subconsciously, consciously, we can say, I have been using this body to, as a means in and of itself, I have made my life about making this body comfortable. And now I'm going to assign the body a different purpose. I'm going to make this body a medium of love in the world. And then as long as I keep my focus on that, I can trust that health will be the result. And it doesn't mean that you're never going to get sick because there's so much going on unconsciously that we don't know about, but it does mean that we can go through our days differently and thus get closer to bringing ourselves home no matter what. I completely agree, of course, with that. I think that this is a long transition we're talking about. That whole behavioral shift that I was talking about a bit ago, it's massive. It does. It won't happen overnight. And so from my standpoint, we have to realize we're in an in-between place where yes, we need to have a, a winter coat like Helen was shopping for. Um, we can't be like some of those Tibetan monks that can just be in a loincloth at high altitudes in the snow and be fine. We're not there yet, okay? Um, but as we give ourselves more fully to that new mode, how can I help? We will find, as the Course teaches, that some of the demands and needs and vulnerabilities of the body start to fall away. Okay, and so... As they fall away, then that's the fruit that I was talking about earlier. Maybe you've just done this, but I feel like we're at the top of the hour, so we should probably be wrapping up. Do you want to summarize the big picture here? Like what's the what's the big punchline? I feel like we've been doing that all along, but if you if you want to to give us some final thoughts, then I'm sure that'd be appreciated. Well, from the course's standpoint, we need to do those two things in the formula. We need to actually lift off of the body the conventional purposes, the ego-based purposes that we have been assigning it, the purposes of attack and pleasure and pride. And then as those get lifted off, we need to assign it the new purpose of merely being an instrument for extending love, which is means forgiving miracles. And as we do those two things, lift the one set off of it, 
assign the new purpose to it, we will find it taking on more and more health. Um, we're not going to be there anytime soon. So it's not, this health will not be the perfect superhuman health the course is talking about, but hopefully we get closer and closer there because we actually are making that shift. And as we make that shift, our body will reflect it and everybody around us will feel it. It won't be a mystery. I just love this idea that the course is focused on our physical health. It's not just saying, well, the body's illusory, so you don't have to worry about what you do with it or what you do to it. And it's like you can assign a new purpose to the body and that is what creates the health. And so it kind of covers both of the bases. It covers like, yeah, you know, it's understood that you experience yourself in this body, but give your body a spiritual purpose and that's how you heal the physical. And mm -hmm. so I just think that, again, what an incredible reframe. Who thinks of their days this way? Who thinks I'm just going to use my body as a way to express love? And who associates that with health? So I just really, I'm feeling very inspired by this message. I want to like, embed it and embody it. And I, I hope that we've inspired others with this conversation too. So if you're joining us live, thank you so much for being here. If you want to join us for a future Exploring Your Course in Miracles conversation, we record every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can register for the link for free at circleofa.org forward slash events. Thank you, Robert. And on behalf of all of us here at The Circle, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.